Good morning, faithful listener. You are listening to the Bible Explained podcast, where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and stay tuned as we read through the book of Luke. Alrighty, faithful listeners, guess what? I did a ton of research for this episode today, and I am just like rearing to go. Because <laughs> this is a controversial one and so interesting to me. So let's just go ahead and read this. I'm going to just jump in and I'm going to read Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 38 today. So grab your Bible out of whatever version you prefer. I'll be reading out of the W.E.B. this morning. And once again, this is Luke 22, 31 through 38. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have all of you that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. You, when once you have turned again, establish your brothers. He said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. He said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will by no means crow today until you deny that you know me three times. He said to them, when I sent you out without a purse, wallet and sandals, did you lack anything? They said, no, nothing. Then he said to them, but now whoever has a purse, let him take it. And likewise, a wallet. Whoever has none, let him sell his cloak and buy a sword. But I tell you that this which is written must still be fulfilled in me. He was counted with the transgressors. For that which concerns me has an end. They said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. He said to them, that is enough. All right, you can see why this is super controversial, right? I mean, just controversial in opinion. Many people just have so many conflicting opinions on what Jesus could possibly mean by these two swords. But before we get into that, let's see what verse 31 has to say. So Jesus just finished the Passover supper with his disciples where he made the new covenant with the entire world, not just with his disciples, but the entire world now has a new covenant with Jesus. No longer the old covenant, which was the Old Testament law, but now the new covenant, which is uh, Jesus's forgiveness and grace to people. So right after the Passover dinner, he leaves with his disciples to go to the Mount of Olives, right? Or the Mount Olivet is what it's sometimes called in scripture. And he was going there to pray with some of his disciples. And as they're walking along, it sounds like, here's what verse 31 says. The Lord said, Simon, Simon. So he says his name twice. It's like a dramatic thing. Simon, Simon. And it's also interesting, I just noticed this now, that Jesus does not call him Peter here. Because Peter means the rock, right? He's calling him Simon, Simon, which is Peter's old name before he became the rock. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan asked to have all of you that he might sift you as wheat. So in other words, Satan was after Peter's soul or Simon's soul. He was after Simon because Simon was in fact the rock. Simon was the one that the church was going to be built on. That's what Jesus says when he renames Simon Peter. He says, you're the rock that is going to be, uh, that the church is going to be built on. In other words, Peter was the foundation, right? I mean, obviously Jesus, of course, was the foundation and the builder and everything else. But once Jesus goes up into heaven, Peter becomes the start of the early church, the foundation of the early church. So Jesus says, Simon, Simon, not calling him Peter. Satan is after your soul. It says he has asked for you to have all of you that he might sift you as wheat. In other words, Satan's trying to destroy Peter, totally trying to destroy him. But what's interesting here is what Jesus says. Jesus says, I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. In other words, Satan is behind the scenes and Jesus knows this. Jesus could see spiritual battles. He was very in tune with the spiritual side of things. He's very in tune with demons and demonic presence. The side we Christians just don't see very well. So he says, there's a spiritual battle going on with you, Simon. And he says, I've prayed for you. I am praying for you that your faith wouldn't fail. And then he says this, when you have turned once again, establish your brothers. So in other words, he's saying to Peter, you are going to stumble. Your faith is going to stumble, but it won't fail 
I prayed for you. Your faith is not going to fail. And when you return again to me, after you stumble, establish your brothers and sisters. And that word used at the very end, brothers, could be uh, translated as either brothers or sisters. So just establish the church is what Jesus is saying. And I find it really interesting that uh, Jesus prayed for his disciples. That kind of shows like Jesus's prayer life being so strong. And you, you wouldn't think that Jesus, who is God, would have to pray. But <laughs> Jesus prays on so many occasions. In fact, he's currently going with his disciples to go pray on Mount Olives, right? So yeah, I mean... Jesus demonstrated the kind of prayer life that you and I are supposed to have where we actively seek that relationship because prayers aren't just saying, you know, sitting down to a meal and saying a prayer. We, I talked about what prayer was a few episodes back. Prayer is just having a conversation with God. Really, it's just talking with God often and establishing that relationship, because if you don't talk with God often, how can you establish a relationship with him? And that goes for anybody. Like if you're going to have a relationship with somebody, you have to talk to them in some form or another, <laughs> whether it's through texting or talking or, uh, you know, you have to establish some sort of communication with that person. So that's why Jesus and other people in the Bible say to pray without ceasing. In other words, just talk to God all the time. Whenever you get a chance, talk to God because you need to establish that relationship with him. So Jesus was praying for Peter's soul. And what's more, we find out later on, in fact, I believe in the book of John, we find out that Jesus didn't just pray for Peter. He prayed for you and he prayed for me. He prayed for every single Christian that was about to become a Christian and way into the future everyone who had become a Christian. He prayed for them. He prayed for me. I mean, that's so wonderful, I suppose, to think about that Jesus actually prayed for me and he prayed for you too. So then after this, Peter's like, no, no, Lord, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. He's like, I am ready to go to both prison and to the death with you is what Peter says. And at the time, I'm sure Peter was really feeling that. You know, when we're not like, directly in the moment of something happening, we often think that we can do something and then it turns out we can't do it. Like, <laughs> for example, bungee jumping. <laughs> you get to the top, you think you can do it, right? Y you believe that when you get up there, you're going to jump, but you get up there and you get sick to your stomach when you look down and you can't bungee jump. I mean, it's kind of the same thing. We think we can do things, but once the moment comes where we actually have to do that thing, it's much harder. I mean, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is very weak. <laughs> and that is a verse in the Bible also. Jesus says to Peter, he's like, no, no, Peter. He says, you don't understand. You're going to deny me today. Like when the rooster crows, you are going to deny me three times. He's going to, you're going to deny that you even know me is what Jesus says. And I'm sure Peter was like, no way. What are you talking about? I'm not going to do that. So after this, this is the kind of the curious part that I had to really research for you guys. And I'm going to take off my Western lens, my America lens, because I live in the land of guns, beer and freedom. <laughs> so I'm going to take off that Western lens and try to think about this next part very objectively, which is why I read so many differing opinions about this from people who live in different countries, um, from people even from different denominations. I even read one from a Mormon perspective. Not that I fully agreed with that one, but I just read a bunch of different perspectives of what these next verses could possibly mean. And so I'm going to tell you my opinion at the end, though I'm going to present you with a lot of different differing opinions. So here's what Jesus said. I'm just going to read this entire thing. He says to them, when I sent you out without the purse, wallet or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. Then he said to them, but now whoever has a purse, let him take it. And likewise, a wallet, whoever has none, let him sell his cloak and buy a sword. For I tell you that this, which is written, must still be fulfilled in me. He was counted with the transgressors for that, which concerns me has an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said to them, that is enough. Okay. So the two swords thing, right? I'm going to present the first opinion. <laughs> the first opinion 
was that these two swords are not talking about physical swords. They are talking about the word of God, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when Jesus says to go out and sell your cloak and buy a sword, there's an opinion that says, no, that doesn't mean an actual sword. That means go out and arm yourself with the word of God. So that's the first opinion. Don't forget that one. The second opinion is that Jesus never promoted any kind of self-defense whatsoever. And when he told his disciples to buy the swords and they said, look, we have two swords. And Jesus says, that's enough. As in, that's enough swords. He was saying that it was okay for his disciples to have two swords because he needed to be counted with the transgressors. And what that means is he needs to be counted as one of the sinners, right? That is prophecy from Isaiah 53, verse 12. And we're going to find out later that Peter wields his sword (laughs) to cut off uh, an ear of one of the men that was taking Jesus to his trial. We're going to find that out uh, very soon. That's another opinion is that the only reason Jesus wanted his disciples to have swords was so that he could be counted as a transgressor, as part of the sword wielding group of disciples, right? As part of the sinners. And the third opinion is that Jesus is promoting self-defense and that he tells his disciples that he's no longer going to be around and that they need to be able to defend himself. But now the problem with that comes in when Uh, Jesus tells Peter to put his sword down after he cuts the ear off of that servant. Jesus says, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And so he tells Peter to put his sword down. Now, the fourth opinion says that none of these things that Jesus talks about, the wallet, the purse, the cloak, or the sandals, none of those things are material items. Rather, the entire segment that Jesus is talking about here, it's an analogy that Jesus is trying to make to try to get the disciples to understand what was about to happen to him, that he was going to be taken away from them and that he was going to be counted with the transgressors. And that's what Jesus was saying. So at the very end, when the disciples bring him two physical swords, Jesus is like, oh boy, (laughs) like that's enough. You guys still don't get it. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, that opinion does make some sense to me, I suppose. But I would like to hear your guys' opinion on it before I air my own. I would love to hear what you guys think regarding this. So you'll find my contact information in the bio of this podcast episode and click on it and send me a little email telling me which of those four opinions make the most sense to you. So I'm going to tell you guys why I believe what I believe regarding this and which opinion I think makes the most sense to me. So the first opinion that the swords are spiritual and that they represent the Bible because it is called the sword, right? We, it says that the Bible is sharper than any two edged sword. That opinion, I believe is ridiculous that Jesus is not talking about physical swords. And the reason I think that it's ridiculous is because if we only spiritualize the swords, and nothing else, because Jesus talks about more than just a sword, right? He talks about a purse, a wallet, the sandals, the cloak. So we'd, if we're spiritualizing just the swords, that makes no sense. Like Jesus is not the author of confusion. We'd have to either spiritualize all of it or spiritualize none of it. So we can't just say that the swords aren't physical swords just because we don't like the fact that Jesus said the word sword. To me, that opinion makes no sense. And I, I truly don't like it. <laughs> I think it's twisting scripture. I think Jesus was definitely talking about a sword, like a a true sword. So that's how I feel about the first opinion. The second opinion that Jesus never calls for self-defense and that the only reason he asked his disciples to hold swords or to carry swords was because he needed to be counted with the transgressors. I also do not think this is the best option for what Jesus is talking about. Though this is, I think, the most popular argument. I think most people believe this and I'm, <laughs> I might get myself in trouble. But the reason I do not believe that this opinion is the best option for what Jesus is talking about here is because Jesus was already counted with the transgressors. His disciples wielding swords were not going to count him anymore as a transgressor. 
we see that that's not what Jesus becomes known for (laughs) uh, when he is put on trial. Rather, they count him with the transgressors or the sinners by making him out to be a revolutionary that was going to destroy the temple. They use Jesus's own words against him. So to me, it makes no sense personally that the reason Jesus was counted with the transgressors was because Peter wielded a sword at one point in time. They were already counting Jesus as a transgressor because they were already getting ready to capture Jesus, to torture him and to kill him and to bring this argument against him to Pilate and to all of the people that he was supposedly going to destroy the temple and build it back up in three days. Now, of course, Pilate, we find out, thinks all of this is garbage and he didn't actually think Jesus did anything wrong. But the crowds counted Jesus as a transgressor. They believed him to be a revolutionary, a person against Rome, a person who didn't pay their taxes. Nothing about the disciples wielding the swords, really, maybe a little bit, had anything to do with Jesus's end trial. All of it had to do with what Jesus had been saying previously regarding taxes and the temple. So I think you guys can already guess (laughs) which one I uh, personally think makes the most sense. And I'm just going to say it outright. I, I do believe that Jesus is telling Christians to defend themselves. However, I believe he's telling Christians to defend themselves, but never in any case, be the aggressor, which is why he ends up correcting Peter and healing that man's ear that Peter had cut off with the sword. Jesus had already told his disciples at this point that he was going to die. Like this was prophesied about. He said, this is going to happen to me. There is nothing anybody else can do to stop it. Like he, he basically had just said that at the Passover dinner. So what was Peter doing besides just making Uh, these people more angry and acting out of fear. In a way, Peter was being the aggressor because Peter had no right or reason to hurt that servant who was just following orders, right? And so this brings me to my other point, though. If Christians are allowed to defend themselves, does that mean we defend ourselves against the government? And that is where I believe the lines get a little bit gray. I think we are allowed to defend ourselves. I do not think there's anything wrong with a Christian defending oneself because otherwise, are we just going to let people rape us, abuse us? There are some things that we do have to defend ourselves from. And it's clear in the Old Testament because you got to look at the entire Bible because the Old Testament really shows God's personality, right? And it really shows what is right and wrong on on a heart level. God had already said that it was okay to defend one's household, right? From a thief that breaks in and steals. A woman who is raped in the street is allowed to cry out. She's allowed to defend herself. This is all stated in the Old Testament. And I mean, don't forget when God calls the Israelite nation to defend themselves. Personally, I don't believe there's anything wrong with a Christian defending themselves. And so when Jesus says here, when I sent you out without a purse, wallet, and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, no, nothing, right? So Jesus is pointing out that he was with them this entire time, but now he's physically not going to be with them any longer. So he says, now you have need of the purse, the wallet, the sandals, the cloak, and the sword. You have need for those things. Personally, I do think that Jesus is saying that it's okay if the Christian does carry the sword and use it in defense, but they cannot live by the sword because if they do, they're going to die by the sword. So it's important to never in any circumstances be the aggressor. It's important to never live by the sword. Going back to my earlier question about whether Christians should defend themselves from the government, we should take measures to vote people who represent us, right? Who represent Christianity and uh, Christian policies the best. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty and the, uh, the government starts persecuting us, I don't know if that's something that we should fight against. And I even lean on, no, we shouldn't fight against that because it does say later on, Paul talks about how we should submit to governing authorities. And we do see that Paul on many occasions submits to governing authorities. And Peter does, and many of the the disciples did submit to governing authorities 
even though those governing authorities were not so good. However, a Christian is not supposed to be meek. So if somebody comes in and it's not a government person, if it's it's some rando off the street, we don't just let them walk all over us. We don't just let them rape us, abuse us, come into our homes and steal stuff. We, we don't do that. It is biblical and clear all throughout scripture that we don't allow that because that is injustice. And we should fight those people and we should fight for people who are powerless. That is so clear in scripture. So I do think it's dangerous when people say that it is never good for a Christian to defend themselves. I think that's uh, dangerous on so many levels because if we don't defend ourselves, we're going to be walked all over. And on top of that, we're going to be so meek that we're never going to be able to boldly spread the gospel and defend the gospel. That being said, I know this podcast episode is getting very long. Defense of the gospel is the most important thing. Hands down. We need to defend the gospel first and foremost. I know this is a hot button topic. I know this is very controversial. And I'd love to hear your guys' opinions on it, on it especially if you don't agree with me. <laughs> I would like to hear that because I'm not afraid of a little debate. I enjoy a little debate now and then. But friends and faithful listeners, I do hope that you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure you subscribe and also like and share the podcast episodes. Now, of course, you're going to find all my links to everything from my books that I've written to my website, to my YouTube page. So look down below in the bio of this podcast episode and click the links that you like and subscribe to all that stuff. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Happy listening and God bless. Ooh.